hello and welcome to the great ship's comment response video which was last week's most popularly commented on video and well two things one i just realized i don't have a front cover with a ship and line on it and i really should sort of I'll sort that out so i'm gonna message the person who does my colors and see if they'll do me a favor secondly the person who i fought had suspicions of giving uh, of getting me this. Turns out they hadn't. It was they, they the exact words were. I thought about it. I was planning on it, but I haven't actually done it yet. I went, okay. So I now have no clue. So thank you, whoever did it. I don't know. Secondly, as said, uh, we are third, well. Thirdly, as said, we're going to be doing this instead of a book review. I'm going to be doing this. I'm going to be doing that. And so I'm going to introduce you to a new camera. We're going to be building a, a building later. I'm going to be using my old streaming camera, which is currently watching my floor. You see there's a bit of a messy bit down here where I've pumped a load of cables, but it was until it got knocked by me a second ago. The Fluffy Research Assistant camera. See? He's modeling his cardigan. Not the gra not the not necessarily the best camera in the world, but it's going to be the second cam so you can see the construction is going on. So we'll have that going on a position to look across my desk as I'm building it as I'm answering questions. You also see why that's going to be a far smaller screen that I'm still this screen this camera is still going to be the big main screen because honestly if I make that too big it looks weird but you know you can make out the fluffy pattern oh you want your belly rod of course of course we have we have we have a choice so that is the fluffy research assistant camera at the, for the uh, for this particular recording so. And you can see how dirty someone's muddy paws have made my carpet. I, I will need to s properly clean these carpet tiles, which, luckily, I think I can put them in the washing machine. Not sure, but anyway. You're enjoying yourself down there. That's where he is normally sitting. So when you hear me talking randomly during videos and recordings, that is because he actually is fairly good. He doesn't jump up all the time. He spends a lot of his time, though, on the uh, sitting on the floor next to me. And he does actually have more space. He has a whole den area over there at the entrance to my office, which I set up for him. But instead, he prefers to curl up right next to me. And bring in his muddy paws. He's a good boy. Right. So, without much further ado... And leaving the fluffy, uh, uh, fluffy researcher camera going. Oh, he's, he's now jumping up. You decided you wanted to be on the better camera. Okay. All right. Show everyone you're here. Yes, that's good. You're beautiful. I don't know. Poodles, 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 poodles. You're never fly. You're certainly never shy, are you? Oh, biscuit. We will get to the comment response in a second. I do apologize. But, you know, it, it, it's, it's far... You know, he deserves his biscuit. His biscuit. He certainly thinks he does. Right. So, comment response. You're knocking your camera now. Do you want the better camera? Is that it? Are you going, no, 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 Papa, you have the, you have the, uh, the other camera. I want the better camera. Right then. You getting up again? <sighs> Fluffs. Right then. Paul from Chicago, thank you very much for the compliment. You are planning on this being a very fluffy orientated video, aren't you? <laughs> yes, you are. Right, Atrus for done. In some ways, it does seem strange. 
to have an industry over the use of forests. Nowadays, there is a lot of sustained forest planning, and I can't help but wonder if most of the methods to make sustainable forests come about, come from the RN, planning to get shed loads of timber. Lots of shed loads. So, as this year of technology, what effect does the level of sanitation required to build the RN from peeps of time on have upon industry in the area? It looks to me like all this san is sanitization is the prerequisite infrastructure and investment, such as a massive foundries for set weight cannon, the creation of what was essentially giant factories for ships, repair facilities, national debt to fund it, all that are all things which would drive Britain to get the Industrial Revolution. Do you agree with this generally being true, or is it something which would require a video to go in further into? Well, it's like the French naval aviation video, is my short answer. Yes, long answer, it's complicated, we'll need a video and a half properly. And I am tempted to do a video on the naval roots of the industrialization. Uh, what, the, what is that on the floor? I have... Oh, that's for those! I've been wrapping things and sending them again, and our foam sheets have been out. That's where that label came from. Are you going to get down now? No, you've knocked your camera. You're going to get down. Okay. Paul uh, Chicago, that's a great question. It's a huge level of standardization. Like Alex said, it would require some video. One of the items that people don't think about, but really should, are block and tackle systems. I don't mean the item itself, but the entire system to create them. The RN needs a standardization, quality control, distribution action. You could definitely argue the RN pulled industry forward, no pun intended. Rope is another. The Royal Navy had their own special rope. And a little bit beyond this period, but coal standardization was huge, and the Royal Navy was a big part of that. And also just the Royal Navy, there were good arguments being made that the Arsenal in Venice as being the first modernized industrial plant. There are good arguments to be made for, about the Venice one. But I would argue that the trouble with Ven the Venetian one is that they kept it all within one site. And by their nature of Venice, they had to, but they did keep it all within one site. The Royal Navy rope is always an interesting one, because most people don't realise this, but when the Royal Navy gets a new ship, whether they've captured it or whether they've procured it, now normally they give it new rope. If it's not a Royal Navy built ship and doesn't come with Royal Navy rope, they will take all the rope off it and put Royal Navy rope on it. Why? Because they have no faith in foreign made rope. And one of the interesting things about the French when it comes to capturing British ships, the highest priority item is to try and get British maps because British, Britain's been mapping their coast, uh, the coastline and the, the world far better than they have. And so they want to use the British maps to be able to navigate their own ships and British charts. But the next most important thing, not the cannon, not the ship, no, 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 it's the British rope. The French could never understand how the British could produce such vast quantities of this stuff to such a high standard. Because they kept trying to set up a centralised single rope maker and they could never produce enough. Whereas Britain had multiple builders and multiple makers of rope. And if you go to Woolwich, uh, if you go to Chatham Docks, you can still see to this day rope being made in the traditional way. And the British were able to do this because of people like Pepys, because of the centralisation at, at the core of the Admiralty. Because, again, it's that interesting scenario. In You just keep knocking your own camera, don't you? You don't like You want a better camera. Okay. Well, when the replacement for that comes, you can have that one. How's that sound? You're not happy with me? Okay, all right. Uh, the British are doing this standardization because, as said, they do have corruption. Every government at this point has a lot of corruption. But the thing is about Britain is they're allowed, they will accept corruption as long as you produce to the quality required, otherwise you'll probably lose your head, or you, and also, you don't, aren't that excessive with the corruption. If you're excessive to the point that everyone can tell you're corrupt, you're going down. Which puts you in a sort of problem. It means you're allowed to be corrupt and charge more than you need and make money on the side, as long as what you produce for the Navy is the standard. Because if it isn't the standard, you won't get any more contracts, you won't get to be corrupt, and they will come for their money. Which sort of works, because again, the people who are doing quality control are corrupt. So you'd think 
they'll take the bribes. But no, they earn their money by proving you failed. And then, of course, you have the people aboard the ships. And if a ship's officer reports back to getting substandard rope. Oh, my Lord. And again, remember that what I said. There are lots of people reporting. In the end, you have to, because of the sheer amount of bureaucracy, and that's the secret to the British, really, in terms of the Admiral Navy, the sheer amount of bureaucracy going on. Hello. The sheer amount of bureaucracy meant that there were so many pieces of paper going back and forth, you could never bribe everyone to cover it up. And for a ship's officer, getting bad rope was a good way of getting yourself and your crews killed. So, frankly, there isn't enough money, really, you can pay a ship's officer to take substandard rope. And they will know. They will know very quickly. Because they'll be told by the chiefs. Even if they don't spot it themselves. The sailing master, the senior NCOs on the ship will soon spot it and tell. And they have to write reports as well. So you think about that. You do bad rope. You're going to have to bribe the officers on pretty much every ship it goes to. And the NCOs on every ship it goes to. To not mention that in their reports back. And remember, that bad rope could cost them lives. So you have to bribe them enough that they think it's worthwhile risking their life for it. Think of how much money that costs, how much money you can actually make doing bad rope. It's not worth it. Hello. Sorry, he wants a lot of extra attention today because his brothers had to go to the, um, well, his brothers had to go for a trip. He's okay, it's just injections day. So this one is being even more I'm the only human left, aren't I? Everyone else has deserted you. Oi, caramba. That was me. <laughs> I think I might have to turn... He seems to be not using the, his own camera, so I'm going to turn that off a second, because that's just creating extra image, which we don't need. <sighs> You're not using a camera. It's terrible. You could have been using it and making yourself a star. Instead, you're just taking over mine. <laughs> Run! Oh. Um, Paul a huge part of the Raj was based on imperial control, uh, control of teeth. Yes, it was one of the critical things from India. People often think about sort of the importance of India as they talk about the wealth, you know, etc. Actually, there are two reasons. The biggest reasons the British were out in India. Tea and teak. And if you look at the railways the British constructed in India, when they eventually got around the when they were sort of constructing them, the things they pr uh, they pull out of India, tea and teak. Yes, there are a few other mines which are useful and this sort of thing, but no, it's tea and teak. And frankly, to this day, I think teak is still a fairly good industry for India. Seth Dawson, even though a good speaking of North American hardwood, a good 60 second video idea. How the RM would have reacted to the giant California redwoods if they had more interest in the, in, interest in the Pacific this time? Probably would have looked at them and gone, can we use this wood? And the thing is, if I remember correctly, redwoods are very big, but they're not, they're very brittle. So they would need to be very much seasoned. I have a feeling that RN would figure out a way to use them. I think probably not in hulls, but maybe in deck planking. Maybe. And, as I said in the original video, you want the money for you? That's the whole reason for corruption, sad times. If you have to pay off a sufficiently large enough people to actually be able to succeed with the corruption, you can't afford to be that corrupt. So, where is the main corruption that comes with rope making? It comes with the offcuts. You make all this rope, the Navy only wants the best, so they take the best, but they have to pay you for all the rope you made. So you get the offcuts. And it's the same wood or wood. You get the offcuts. And the offcuts can be made into other things. That rope can be that rope which doesn't pass naval inspection. 
but still good enough to be made, can be sold to the merchant ships. That wood, which is left over because it's not useful to be used for a ship, it doesn't pass inspection on a ship. The craftsmen in the dockyards would make chairs, would make tables, would make all sorts of things. They made them for the ships anyway. They were very skilled at it. They would make them and sell them from the offcuts. You still have furniture around the UK, which you can still find dates from that period. And when I'm talking about furniture, I'm not talking about IKEA level stuff. We are talking about furniture which would be sold to very, very posh, very, very rich, influential families would buy that. And it's fine. That's technically corruption because uh, that's not your wood. But it's in the wood the Navy's not planning on using anyway. So it's a dark area. And you're using the Navy equipment and usually just working after you've done your Navy pieces. Because you remember, in the dockyards, you're paid by piece. So you produce the piece. And it's done. Now, you can work all day producing multiple pieces. If you can. Or... You do some piece work, so you maintain. Uh, so you've uh, you've got your workspace, all these things allocated, and then you use your workspace and the tools you have and the things you have access there to build your uh, build the furniture, which you then sell for a higher profit. It's corruption, but it's an acceptable level of corruption. The Royal Navy doesn't care; they're still getting their pieces done. Merely not the maximum you could do in a day, but they're getting enough to get to build their ships. So, speaking of paperwork, did the RN have their own paper mills for all those end cuts or off cuts or end defects so they could produce their own paper and wadding? Um, no, I said, I said what happens to the off cuts, etc. Uh, the RN had a lot of interesting commercial relationships going on, though. They really did. To reckon that, um, in 1720s, you have British officials loving around. Uh, loving going around the US surveying our trees to build their ships. 2020s, you have British and our German and French officials surveying our trees to convert into biomass. I think it's time we close the door on that. They want to deforest the country for fuel so they can start deforesting their own forests. Ah, not out. Um, I would add that in the 2020s, yes, you might well have British and German and French companies going out looking around American things for biomass, but mostly they're looking at commercial forests. And it's the same in the UK. And the point I'd make is if those commercial forests are producing enough wood, enough biomass that America is able to sell it as well as use it all for their things, either you're not using it to the maximum capacity you can be, which means there needs to be investment in more biomass facilities over in America, or we're not producing enough. And to be honest, I would argue it's a bit of both. America's gone heavily into producing the biomass but hasn't gone into heavily into using it. European nations seem to have gone heavily into using the biomass, but haven't gone as heavily into producing it. And one of the interesting things is Britain is that we've, there's a latency, of course, with the biomass. So we've got a lot of biomass projects for generation of fuel planted, and a lot of them growing. And the only reason I know about this is because of me actually looking into research for this project and looking into trees with the foreign managed forests are still going on. But the trouble is, it takes time for those trees to mature at which the point they can be used. So we needed to have planted them about 30 years ago for them to be start to be useful now. And we actually started planting them about 15, 20 years ago. So we have about a decade. Now, at this point, people tend to go start going around and trying to blame multiple governments. And you can. But ultimately, you have to, if you want to say we should have planted them 40 years ago, or 40 years ago, if we go back, that's the governments in the 1980s, which were not really a fay with the whole environmental thing, etc. And yes, we had a conservative government at the time. 1990s, which is 30 years ago, that was started off the conservative government, and then 1997, it becomes a Labour government, which do start to encourage some of the planting. But they don't start to encourage the planting until they're about three to five years into their first into office. So... And the problem is, is people just didn't see it coming. And you have the same thing with nuclear power. People operate often when they're trying to make these long-term political judgments 
on the idea that the same conditions that persist today are going to persist forever. I, in that period, they're persisting on, well, we're always going to have act with supply of natural gas, so why do we have to bother? We're not investing in new nuclear plants. We're not, in, uh, in natural gas is cleaner than coal and fuel, so we're getting better that way, and eventually solar and wind will come online and be a viable source. And we've got hydroelectricity as well in the meantime as well, so we don't need to do that. And then you get to the 1990s, uh, and the t you get to the 2000s, and people start thinking about a future. But if you consider in 2010... The nuclear pro a nuclear new nuclear power plant program is paused because of the coalition government. The Lib Dems believe it shouldn't be it should be paused because it's not necessary. One of the reasons they use is because you can always get cheap gas a gas from Russia. Because in 2010 it was considered viable. Now there were people even in 2010 going, hang on, have you seen what? These people are like who you're getting into bed with. No. They don't, because it didn't serve them politically at the time to look into it. And eventually the problems become so uh, so problematic, they have to look into it, have to respond to it. And that's why you get this emergency. It's a problem. And one of the reasons, I, one of the things I asked in this video and I was talking about was the fact that the length of time you have to consider things over. You're talking about 100, 200 years. You have to start thinking in terms of century-based timelines. Trying to get politicians, trying to get national governments to plan beyond the next election is difficult. You know, the one point I have sometimes where I start to argue that maybe election terms should be lengthened, that instead of being four years or five years, it should be eight years or ten years, is because it would make the politicians have to think slightly longer term. Because if you're having to think along uh, uh, across a whole decade, then you ha then the things you have to start to consider are going to be the things which are going to affect 20, 30 years down the road. Whereas if you're thinking let's say, in terms of four or five year terms, you can think fairly short termist. You can think in terms of, right then, am I going to concentrate on getting a big boost in in our members in the, I don't know, in the Senate or the, uh, uh, you know, the Senate or the House of Representatives, if I concentrate on getting policies which will pay off in two years for the midterm, so it'll look really good in two years' time, or do I concentrate on my election in four years' time? It's... It's a problem. And it's understandable. Because most of those politicians think, well, it doesn't matter. As long as I'm in power, I will make the right decision. Based on the criteria which I have, which is obviously right, because I've been elected. So they concentrate on keeping themselves in power because then they're there to make decisions. Rather than thinking about, hang on, what about this long-term plan? And often long-term problems are short-term pains. Think about this from the perspective of Britain when organising all this. When laying out those forests. They had to turn, in some, places, some areas, agricultural land. In some areas they had to deal with traditional um, commons areas, which were not good for the local people. There were all sorts of problems created by creating these forests. They were not universally popular. But they were done because it was considered the long-term interest of the nation-state. Which was in turn considered the long-term interest of the people. Whether they really liked it or not. And there is the problem that today we have the issue of the short-term pain and I can get really controversial in terms of politics because I can agree with people that they deserve more money for their pay but I also want to ask the question of where is that money coming from and that is often the problem because that is often what I turn around where do you take the money from where do you get the money from because governments don't produce money they are there to provide a communal use, a communal venture for our money to provide the things we need for the nation state to operate, for the nation to operate. 
infrastructure, education, all those critical things, defence, security, policing, all those things which you need health in the UK, which is critical. All those things you need and need to be part of it and need to be some long-term thinking need to be behind, that's what they're there to provide. That's what the government provides. That's what it, how it helps you. And basically the idea is you're all paying as much as you can or what you can as a proportion of your income, on your wealth, and they use that collective money to pay for those things. Because we're all made, all our lives are made better by having that infrastructure, by having those things. That's the point of government. Government doesn't generate money. So to get more money to pay people higher wages, they need to either up taxes or go into debt. Which may, uh, which means basically future generations are going to have to pay for it with higher taxes or less investment in infrastructure and other things. It's all a long-term question. And the trouble is we don't have and we don't often do the long-term thinking. It's always tomorrow's problems. There is a real issue with that in modern politics. And it's a good thing you can learn from looking for history in that they were forced. They might not have wanted to think long-term, but the very nature of these trees, the very nature of of the growth process meant they had to think long term. You can't think in terms of less than a hundred years when you're planting oaks. You can't. They grow too slow. And so when you're talking about the biomass and the trees, yeah. That is probably happening. But the reason that's happening is because on one side, you've got people who have fought in advance in terms of planting the trees, but haven't put in the infrastructure of actually using those trees. On the other side, they fought in advance of using the infrastructure, creating the infrastructure to use the trees, but they haven't been planting them. Neither side's done joined up long-term thinking. <sighs> so, Thompson, ah, the naval refit classic. Third rate, is that where third times the charm comes from? Either way, or down, uh, uh, up or down the tree, just right. Um, hello. Yes. Well, I don't think that's where third time the charms comes from, but third rate... It's kind of interesting because second rate's become this thing in our history, in our language, where second rate is considered bad. But you don't hear third rate. People don't go, oh, that's third rate. That's terrible. They go, second rate, oh, it's not good. But no one says third rate as a bad thing. And I think that is a legacy of the period. Hello. Staff Thompson, today's key mass infrastructure deployment. For Canada, development of old railroads that crisscross the province of Ontario interlinked to a national system, expansion of St. Lawrence Seaway to post Panmax capabilities, as well as the interlake locks, embracing nuclear energy on all fronts, research, development, use, waste, storage, and subterranean facilities as the Canadians, Scandinavians are built. It does work. It's, however, again, that's a temporary solution. We can't store them down there forever. We have to think of a way to actually solve it, which is where Sellafield comes in in the UK. And actually try and sort of clean it. I'm not sure how much uh, how well it works really. Uh, I'm. I think they're still really developing those processes. As well as the traditional sh trades such as pipe fitters, as well as carpenters, draftsmen, and a more educational system open uh, so those those who may do better under the Edwardian Victorian method can pursue that course, and those who do better under the Prussian system can continue as we have for the last hundred years. Hmm. I think. I know I would like, I, th I understand the difficulties because of the, working in education, of designing an educational system which fits everyone. But in the UK, we had this really good idea not long ago called the BTEX. It doesn't feel that long ago. Which encouraged people to pursue vocational and trade training. And 
I thought they were a really good idea. I don't think they've necessarily been used and developed as well as they could be. Because I think they could have been used better. Because one of the troubles we have, and I'm a big proponent of university education. I like people going to a university. I'm a historian. The, literally, the place you go to learn to be a historian is university, if you want to get the actual qualifications. It, but that doesn't necessarily... You know, having qualifications doesn't necessarily make you a historian, in my book. And... Sometimes people without the qualifications are actually better historians than some people with the qualifications also in my book. We'll leave that to one side. That's uh, personal views. But... There are some qualifications and some skills. I have friends who, well, they've gone on to become aircraft mechanics and all sorts of qualifications. And yeah, some of them actually ended up going back to university. They needed to go get their master's or something, and so they tend to look me up and go, so how do we write papers? How do we do this? Because we've never done this in our training so far. Because once you reach a certain level, and this is where the university side of it comes in, and I, this is where I have the problem with sort of with BTECs, and I think they have been used quite as well as they could be. You can have the practical skills, but you need to be able to communicate with people who don't have that knowledge and don't have those skills. And that means you need to be able to usually write and explain your stuff, uh, your stuff in standard English. And that's where often those people who've got those great vocational qualifications and have done really well reach a signaling for themselves in industry and then need to come back for a master's course. Or something to be able to talk, basically to communicate what they do with people who are not knowledgeable in that field. Hello. Are you up here for a reason? So it's. Yeah, again, it's the lack of joined up thinking on that front. I'd have said bolting on a communication segment of how to communicate. Um, would have been useful. And I don't see that vaulted onto the BTECs anywhere, sadly enough. There are BTECs in communications, which are some interesting courses and interesting capabilities. And I do know that one of the people I work with quite regularly who does, who specialises in that field, does have a BTEC in it. And they are very, very skilled at it. So, Sue Mikowski, after listening to this question, are there still tall trees still trees in Britain? This was too excellent not to join in. Thank you. And yes, there are still trees in Britain. Lots of them. There's actually one that I look out outside my window every day, which when I'm working, which is a huge oak tree in someone's garden. We have a cherry tree in ours. Um yeah, well, government's planning 150 days ahead these days as a stretch. I wouldn't be quite that cruel, but yeah. Um, Luke Anderson, ironically, the calorific argument was less apt than you might have imagined, as most food types have extremely similar, a similar calorific contact, with a notable exception of fats. So changing the ratio of icing, uh, essentially pure carbohydrate, to flour and eggs to mix carbohydrate and protein, will have essentially no effect on the energy content, as all these give 17 millijoules kilograms upon digestion. The real variation comes from the amount of butter, fat used, close to 37 millijoules. Assuming your cake is relatively dry, I have no idea what your log is in that regard, have never seen one. Uh, it's not relatively dry, and yeah, it is different. Um, I do understand, I understand where you're coming from, but I was quite selective. If I picked a normal cake, you would be quite right. Although, there again, that relies on me being able to cut the pieces all evenly and perfectly. Again. Uh, I'd like to know how much water flotation or logs was done in the 18th century in the UK. Most old forests don't seem to be situated on particularly large rivers, from what I recall. On the other hand, I know that some uh, that uh, some small rivers were certainly used for that purpose near where I now live in Japan, 9th century. The sorts of things you can span with a long fishing rope. It's an interesting thing. Water flo uh, flotation isn't used as much necessarily as you might think it is, but it is certainly used to an extent in terms of they like to get to places where they can get it. You also have to remember that in the UK, a lot of work has been done since the 18th century in terms of water management. So, some of the places which now have very small rivers going to them used to flood seasonally. 
and they used to float things in and out in the season. So they'd gather all the wood up, and then they'd, oh, it's flooded. Let's float it out. So, yeah, there are some bits of history which uh, don't adapt to modern geography. But also, Britain actually did used to cart a lot of the wood to places which would then, the, the wood would get loaded into the barges. So they'd cart all the wood down. So they used wooden carts to take the wood to barges, which would take uh, take even more wood to the dockyard where the wood would be turned into thing, uh, turned into ships, and the spare wood could be turned into furniture, could be turned into a barge, could be turned into carts, and the cycle continues. Night, Doc. Uh, well, no, night, secret room. Hi, Doc. Uh, would you be doing a video about the British Empire cruise, given it's the hundredth, uh, it's the hundredth anniversary this year? I have to wonder what can be learned from the Empire cruise a century on from it, other than teamwork and the importance of long-term planning. Um, I'm considering it. I know I've touched on it in a few other videos recently, and not that long ago, but I am looking at it. I'm thinking about it as part of the, the series, because of course I have those two lives a month which I pick, and it might well be one of those. Uh, Splinters 5570 uh, Trees still standing Marked with that, uh, that arrowhead Are they still owned by the Navy? What happens if you cut one of those down Ernest? Does the Navy still care of those? Trade them to make money? Wood is very expensive Ernest. They still have protections Interesting enough I did check this out uh, Under laws that were never repealed So in answer to your question It would make lawyers very rich Probably more than the wood's worth If the Navy decides to get involved I don't think the Navy probably would But it's, uh, it, it's uh, an interesting question and a friend of mine who is actually a forestry law specialist, and when I say friend of mine, I mean, as you know, my best friend, Sam, who films the videos, her husband is a lawyer. And he works at a law firm, and I make friends with some of his colleagues. They're very nice people. And one of them actually does specialise in forestry commercial law. And so I sent a message via... Sam's husband. And what happens in this scenario? And they sent back a message which said, well, in practice, the Navy doesn't usually contest it. Doesn't usually. But if the Navy did decide to contest it, then you'd have trouble. Because the law's still technically on their side. And I'm, oh, that's fun to know. But in practice, most of their wood that's still preserved are in national forests which have a whole other layer of protection on them as well and national parks so you know there is protection going on hello yes you're being very very attentive really very attentive today more attentive than you normally are <sighs> jack Ray, how was wood made available for merchant ships and such was there a season wood for, the, uh, for those Bricks. I'm only guessing here, but the merchant fleet took woods not normally utilised by, uh, by the Royal Navy, such as larch, pine, and other kinds of wood. I would also suspect that they imported a lot of their wood. I do know that more than one Royal Navy ship was built, probably in India, of teak, and so it would not surprise me that uh, that also happened to merchant ships. Finally, I would suspect that some wood delivered but rejected by the Royal Navy was used in, uh, in building merchant ships. As for teak build ships, that was usually East Indiamen, which were built by the East India Company in India. Those were some tough ships, and um, as a rule, you can usually chart the battles which French privateers lo use lose to East Indiamen by... So, uh, was there a teak-built East Indiamen now there? Yeah. What happened exactly? Well, you know, strangest things. The cannonballs were just bouncing off her. Really? Oh, good lord. Um... My response was a mixture of all the above. Plus, of course, privately owned woods could be sold to the highest bidder, although life could be made very difficult uh, if RN didn't get what it wanted. Also, merchant ships were more likely to be built of greenwood as the cost-benefit worked out slightly differently. Yeah, the Royal Navy's looking for 20, 30 years' use of a ship. A merchant ship, they're usually looking for it to pay off in... Well, usually they want it to pay back profit in the first two to three trips and ideally pay, have paid for itself 
and then from that point onwards it's just pure profit whatever comes in other than paying for the crews etc and maintenance and the moment it's no longer useful and no longer able to go to sea they just get a new one daybreaks couple of things first I'm not going to purchase a copy book because I already have one I don't need two I have no objection to you having two I do second what long term item should we currently be looking at two words climate change Third, with regard to the British response to the American converting half their Lexington aircraft carriers and keeping half the battle cruisers, I see one of two things happening. As you know, this video came out this week. The Americans are convinced to give up the two of the Lexingtons, leaving only two as aircraft carriers and two as battle cruisers, or the British would not utilize the G3s, but rather lay down two more admirals, one as an aircraft carrier and one as a battle cruiser. Or probably more accurately, they would lay down both additional ships as aircraft carriers for the modified Admiral aircraft carrier design building three of the original four admirals as battle cruisers and only converting one to an aircraft carrier. That would give them more uniform, a more uniform force and would allow for a quicker build, since they already have the admiral design, but we're still working on the G3 design. Interesting idea, but I will counter that with... You're giving the Royal Navy the opportunity to build two 16-inch battle, uh, battle cruisers, which is how it sort of worked out once I worked through a logical reason for it actually happening. Rather than just starting with the question, I first had to work out a logical scenario for that to actually take place. And so the three Admiral aircraft carriers is the route I went, and they build two new cap battle cruisers. Because again, I think as a rule, they're going to be happier converting an aircraft carrier, which they're still working out the utility of, versus building a less viable battle cruiser in their mind. Um, I would agree with you on the, sort of the climate change. I think this is going to sound strange because the trouble is for years it was billed as global warming and now it's billed as climate change. And I don't agree with the people who go to the thing of I'm not going to have children because of it or die or anything like that. That's um, well beyond my views of what it is and what we should do, and I certainly don't think we need population controls or anything like that. But I think it's sensible to adopt a policy of well, things have to be treated with respect, and one of those things that has to be treated with respect is you have to respect the weather and you have to respect the climate. So, if you're looking at probable issues with food, etc., issue respect and start trying to figure out a way to either minimize its impact or to prevent its impact. And that's what we need to be focusing on. We need to be a, a way focusing on, how do I put this, on finding better ways to do things so that we minimize the impact and the effect. Because what it seems to be that humans are having, and this is a historian who has a passion for physics, who has done a bit of reading on the subject, but is by no means an expert, is trying to explain, is that rather than humans causing climate change, the Earth climate changes its climate anyway. It does. But what humans are doing, human activity seems to do, is exacerbating it. So let's say climate change is normally like that. So it does that. Okay. We're making it do... that because we're exacerbating its natural flows so it's going to get hotter the hot periods are going to get hotter and the cold periods are going to get colder sort of thing then well a we have to probably try and work out how to minimize our effect on its exacerbation because it's just going to make things very very hostile to live on and secondly we have to work out how to live in that environment and I think we have to have some pragmatism here. For example, nuclear power. Yeah, 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 I know all the bogeyman stories that come about it, but it's viable, it's here, and it's working now. And if we'd been investing in it for the last decade or so, we'd have it available, we wouldn't be facing any of these problems with gas shortage, and we could probably start turning off a load of gas plants and other systems like that until we actually have solar and wind at a viable stage. And I do agree, there are some people who said this, that wind is more likely to be viable for climates like Europe and anything sort of in the out of the sort of, how do I put it, in the temperate zones, I know, above or below the tropics. 
I can see wind being definitely more viable than the solar. I think you should still have solar, because my personal view is I would like a house which has its own little wind generator and its own solar and solar panels and a battery system. But I'm not sure how I want to build a battery system, because I do wonder if whether we should get to the level of having our own personal water-based battery system rather than having a charging battery using all the different materials which come and have to be extracted to make those batteries. Would it be more environmentally uh, uh, environmentally friendly and sensible? But there again, that then uses up a lot of water. The point is, things like climate change, etc., and in uh, this is a bit of a political discussion, but it's the long-term thinking thing become used and lots of issues become used as for short-term political games by uh, gains by the various political part sides and really they are long-term problems in this period we're talking about the important thing was the different political factions and there were there were the Tories and the Whigs there were the, you know there were the different groups in Parliament They could come together on certain things. National interest, long-term thinking. If you'd asked them to to build a road and said that it was necessary for national growth, they'd have built the road. Didn't matter which side they were on. If they needed to protect a forest so that you'd have wood in a hundred years' time, oh, good lord, you'd do that. You'd find a way to do it that enriches your friends, but you'd do it. Because that was necessary. These days, I often think it's a dirty word to have something which is bipartisan almost. If you look at the coalition governments which run World War I and World War II, national governments in the UK, all parties get together. I don't know if that same sense of working together and unity could be generated in the face of a threat today. I'd like to believe it could. I'd like to believe it would happen. But I honestly have a feeling that there is such a focus by all sides in terms of in some of their prominent personalities on point scoring that such a government wouldn't last 10 minutes and that's scary whatever your views on the world if that's the reality of what's leading us that's scary there are personalities who could. I, I do think there are personalities who would go, work together and who would do it. But you only have to look back to 2010 when we were in face of a national economic crisis and the coalition government comes to power and the things that go on in that coalition government than decisions it makes. Some were good, some were terrible. Pioneer 11. Peeps wouldn't survive two seconds in a modern par parliament. You can't have someone competent, that would make the PM look bad. Uh, Paul Chicago. Peeps is a classic civil servant. He's short, short sighted, and hopelessly middle class. He was no threat to anyone. Pioneer. Uh, sorry, my mistake. Fordham was MP. He, as Paul Chicago points out, he was an MP appointment, but he's still not likely. Uh, he's still not a likely PM. Um, honestly, I there are people like Peeps who I could think of who are in the British Parliament. Well, they were. They've lost their... Hang on, there it is. There's at least one still in there. Um, unfortunately, the, because of the party they're in, they never get anywhere near government. I don't agree with them on all their politics, but they are like Peeps. They are quite 
long sighted in terms of their work and administrative capabilities. It's it's a problem. It's a problem. Mm -hmm. And it's the problem of to an extent with democracy as it is today because in a world where you get constant media interaction, social media, traditional media interaction going on 24 hours a day, it's very easy to A, say something wrong which will damn you forever, and B, very easy for someone who hasn't got substance but ha is very good with the quick one-liners to get very very prominent very quickly there is a point when you have to ask people what's the next 10 words it's like when I talked about earlier I agree teachers nurses deserve more money I'm also not sure where the money comes from and that's the problem. I, it's not a case of I disagree or don't want them to have the pay. I think they deserve it. They deserve more pay. But I don't know where the money's coming from. And that's the problem. And that's some of the, some, one of the scenarios which is an issue. We need to start thinking through what we're going to be doing. And there is often... There has been some issues. One of the traditional departments which has suffered financially is defence. Because post-Cold War, oh, well, you know, there's no peer threat, there's no problems. And then we had the coin counterinsurgency conflicts in the two, from 2000 onwards, Iraq and Afghanistan, and the money was poured into counterinsurgency, and the service which took the lead in that got all the lion's share. And suddenly the world has changed. And that same service is going, well, hang on, we're no longer in... Uh, oh, Germany, we're no longer in a sort of no longer basis there. Uh, we have to justify. And they are, you, you can see this on the news at the moment, and we talked about this in Bilframs. They are turning into, they are spending their time attacking the other service instead of going, hang on, we need to probably actually sit there and think, what are we doing for? What is our purpose? Instead, they're going for the quick, easy, cheap shots to try and make, so blame the other services for their problems. And it's not the other services. It's that there's not been enough money in defence for probably 50 years. Because it's been the easy thing to get rid of, to cut money because no one goes on strike. And... They were used to a certain level of investment because they were the frontline service. And now they're no longer the frontline service. They are. They don't know how to deal with it because they're not the frontline service because they can't be because Britain's not in a ground war at the moment. Sorry, army. I have a lot of respect for you. I work with a lot of you. I've taught a lot of you. You are lovely people. You are hardworking. But some of the cases being made by various former uh, former members of the army on. best hubristic at worst wrong just wrong you know uh, I, I watched one general in a sort of on a retired general talk about how the importance of uh, you needed air support for modern operations and that was critical etc and then next breath he's almost saying oh yes but the aircraft carriers are white elephants he's there go well, how are you going to get the air support then? Where are the air bases? The reason we can't send F-16s to the Ukraine is because the amount of infrastructure you'd have to build in Ukraine to support the F-16s and set up and all the other things. Because it's different from the Soviets, a Soviet system. And you can't really do that in the middle of a war because the odds are the Russians will spot it and will bomb it. Because it's a legitimate target. It's building an air base. And frankly, they, they will be available to. Uh, it... it it, it, there is a significant amount of infrastructure, so you want air support. The odds are, if you want it quickly and available, most places in the world, it's gonna be coming from that air, from that aircraft carrier. It might be manned F-35s, crew with crews aboard, crewed F-35s. It might be uncrewed aircraft. 
we don't know. I think it's going to be a mixture of the both at some point. See, clock. Alex, your explanation goes some way to showing why prize ships are worth so much. It's the cost in time and money for the wood within the vessel. So even if it is damaged beyond repair, that ship can be broken down and then reused as valuable seasoned timber. However, such ships from other nations are not necessarily English oak okay, used in British ships. So how do shipwrights work out how to integrate those varying timbers within a few within a new ship or as materials to repair other ships? Um, is it that those materials are only used to repair the capture other capture vessels, or was this not seen as a problem? Well, my response to that was I have a feeling this is what is it is going to require a comment response video. Um, Steve Clark, it, I'm a bit of a pedant. Uh, pedant, sorry. No, Morris, it's not being pedantic. It's just. After last week's fun, I didn't want to divide this video in two, but was worried about it getting so long no one would reach the end. So, this is where the various critical people in the timber process come in. Now, the various timber rights would be called in to assess a, uh, assess a ship. Foreign ships were still often built of oak. Believe it or not, they still use the same words. It wouldn't be English oak, but it would be oak from their own uh, their own trees. Although sometimes they would use other woods as well, as well. But basically, the oh, the trees used for various parts of the ship are pretty much standard across all the ships, all the nations building ships online. There are some differentials, but you need pretty much wood with similar qualities as you were for that position on that ship as you would on the British ship. But still, the timber rights would go in and assess the wood, and they would give it. Well, basically grade it and decide what they could do. And they, as you're right, again, this is why the wood is so valuable and why ships which are badly damaged can be rebuilt or you use the wood for other things or you use the ship for other things. It becomes a hulk, it becomes a store ship. Again, that's useful. It frees up another vessel. It frees you up from building or using one of your ships which you'd actually prefer to use for combat duties or as maintaining an ordinary that, uh, than uh, being having to be transferred to being used as a hulk. Hmm. Your brother's fine if you're worried. <sighs> Probably not. Right. I assume the three decker second rates were preferred due to having an admiral's cabin. Not really. They are advantage because they are higher than the uh, two, uh, the two decker third rates. But um, yeah, they're not really that useful. That's the trouble. Well, that's then why they go down to the two decker three uh, two uh, two decker second rates, and they actually become far more useful because that's a far more viable ship. More available, more maneuverable. It's a better sailor, and basically you add a third deck onto that, and you get a, free, a first rate up. So, yeah, it's the problems with ship design. Length to beam ratio has and will ever be a crucible that ships are incredible for. What's going? That's odd about the forty-two pounders. I have a couple of books stating that the Royal Navy abandoned the forty-two pounder because it was too heavy. I'm not sure they're what you'd call a serious history though. I don't think I have any professional historian level books on logistics and the Napoleonic time period naval weaponry. Well, one of the interesting things you find about the forty-two pounder is there's a lot of reasons which go around 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 about it about why it's not used. But um, once you start looking at the books, uh, the vessels which are first rates, which would be the ones which would definitely get the forty-two pounders if the Royal Navy has them available, you start to have the issue coming up constantly talking about supply, supply of them. The availability of them. The fact that a 42 pounder is harder to cast and is more difficult to produce and then send out to the ship and get a decent supply of than the other guns. And that, I think, starts to tell its own story. Because if that's the reason for why you're having difficulty putting it on the first rates, then the odds are that's the reason you don't want to put it on any other ships as well. Because it's difficult to cast. Because it is more difficult than the other guns to do. Because you're not producing as many of them. The sheer volume of the other guns you're producing means that, honestly, there are cannon manufacturers who are building 32 pounders just because. 
the ice wing. There is no po They don't wait for the orders to come in to build the 32 pounders. They just keep casting the things. And when the order come, uh, the orders will come in and they just send them out. This is why some uh, gun manufacturers go bankrupt at the end of wars. Because they've already built the 32 pounders because everyone's already buying them. And they don't have enough money to hold up uh, to keep themselves get going till they need a new load of 32 pounders. Which then made a lot of people quite rich because what some people did specialize in doing was they would run a small foundry which would keep building these 32 pounders and keep sort of doing things. But um, then they'd wait for the end of the war and when the other foundries which had been churning out 32 pounders and that's just building them on spec had a huge stockpile and were pretty much tempted to go bankrupt, they'd buy them at a low price, store them, and then sell them for a profit with new marks on them at the beginning of the next war. It's also why the wrong... Uh, one you re one, the thing you realise about the 42 pounder is usually as a rule, the Royal Navy has to wait for the um, the, uh, the national owned arsenals and gun foundries to produce them. And they have they tend to come from them rather than uh, the private ones. Again, make, which makes it more difficult because it means you've got a smaller pool to draw from in terms of their production. And those foundries, again, are kind of heavily uh, dealing with producing guns for the Navy, guns for the Army, guns for all the forts, guns for... You... The interesting thing when we're talking about the colonisation of Australia... I specifically didn't mention them building any fortifications and any cannon going out there with them. Because there seems to be a real debate as to if any did. And it seems to mostly come from the ship's armaments. And they don't seem to have a lot. In fact, it doesn't seem... A cannon and stuff to build a fortification doesn't seem to turn up till not the third, second, but the third of the fleets to go out there. Now, I could be wrong. But it... The second does have trouble and does lose a fair number of ships. So maybe they were dispatched but didn't get there. That's a good... That's a likely chance. Strong possibility. But... Yeah. It's an issue. Port from Chicago. Remodel long-term thinking. One, nation-states should be take a Mahanian approach to cybersecurity. Develop IT talent through government-funded initiatives. Grow out IT talent through government programs into cybersecurity. Sponsor... Hogan's Alleys and like, and GCHQ and NCSC in the UK seem to be doing a nice job of this already. Mm, they could do better, but yeah, I agree with that. To develop, expand in nuclear power for civilian use. Put nuclear reactors in cruisers and larger auxiliaries like hospital ships. Create incentives for smaller, more efficient civilian plants that utilize the new talent. Yep. Three, more slipways in the Great Lakes region. 3A, expand the Great Lakes, Great Lakes infrastructure to near Panamax. 3B. Build nuclear submarines in the Great Lakes. Export Great Lakes submarines to Australia and other Five Eyes partners. <laughs> oh. Seems to be a lot of people talking about um, the Great Lakes infrastructure needing to be expanded. To either Panamax or near Panamax. That's come up a few times. In comments for long-term thinking. Interesting. Richard, imagine if the French unleashed a bunch of mating pair beavers on British soil. Now, what impact would that have on UK shipbuilding back in the day? To be honest, the British would probably have dealt with that issue. Advantage of being an island and quite a managed countryside. Um, you would then respond yourself, Richard, with... Plus, all those folks suddenly in the beaver pelt business and taking profits from French as well. Yeah, I have a feeling we'd have ended up farming beavers. Yeah, that, the British would have ended up with a beaver farm. That's it. And, yeah, short term that'd have been so interesting, but also beavers help with the management of forests at some at certain points. So, yeah, the British would probably adapt to having beavers on their soil fairly quickly. It seems, I didn't expect the Spanish Inquisition in an 18th century ship video. I doubt few would have considered it viable during the video from David Brennan, that seems. Um, Spanish Inquisition is always fun to mention. That point, points to the huge pile of rust. Look, I have laid down to mature and season the steel for the next few years. <laughs> oh, sadly, metal doesn't work that way. That point, other things not to lay down for future and deep reserves in the in the current era are probably computer systems. Mm -hmm. 
I mean, something that is worth, although actually having some hardened computers to do basic functions that doesn't require much computing power or, or should, things you should always store. Like... <sighs> okay, here is something which is gonna sound strange. But if... I was building... putting together a pack, let's say, and I had this conversation because I have a friend who's a, who is really into survivalist. I'm not because, honestly, some of the scenarios they're talking about, yeah, likelihood of anyone surviving that is not high. But leaving that to one point, one of the things that always interests me with a survival pack is they're talking about all this sort of stuff now, and I go, "Where's your solar powered calculator?" Look, we went, why do I need acid? If you're rebuilding civilization, you're going to need solar powered calculators because otherwise you're going to uh, do being limited to a lot of finger and thumb calculations. Because, especially if you think about it, you're probably not going to have pen and paper. But a solar powered calculator, that can work for years, decades, and that's going to really accelerate what you are able to do. Now, you can then point out, well, we have a solar charging battery unit and that we can use to charge our phone, etc. Yeah. That is good. But a phone has a lot more draws on power, and yes, you might want to use it for that, but if you're just using the quick make, quick calculations, having a solar powered calculator won't take up much space and won't take up much weight and will work, help a lot. And it's a backup for if the phone goes, you don't use the calculation capabilities. Something that is worth repairing, although probably not laying down to season in large piles, is our skilled people. Yes, well that is why you need to have an apprenticeship scheme system there. Honestly, you need to start a process whereby skilled people produce more skilled people. And so you maintain the institutional and cultural memory. With historians, this is why we write books, but because it encourages other historians and pass on our knowledge. But also, it's why we lecture and do those things. It's to try and pass on the knowledge that a historian acquires. And the skills we acquire. It doesn't always work that well. But it's one of the reasons why I like doing these videos. It's getting people to try and sort of... And I know we've talked a lot about politics today because we've been doing about long-term thinking. And so that often does bring you into politics. And I'm, I tend to be my policies being equally rude about everyone. But I would say one of the key things about being a historian is you do start to think long term. And especially once you become a professional historian. I, you are someone who is thinking, writing, recording, exp uh, passing on historical knowledge. You have to start thinking long term because history is not short term. People turn around going, well, this happened, so this happened, and it's a few months apart, and you're sort of going, well, that can work in certain scenarios, but um, let's look at the factors of why the first thing happened, and then why the second thing was the obvious response to the first thing. And you're going to find that's a lot longer term thing, a, long, a lot more of a long term scenario than just A equals B. Leslie Mitchell, what a great video. The figures and time frames for the wooden ships are mind-blowing. Would the merchant and Dutch East Indian ships use the same stock of wood, or would they have their own sources? As said, they'd have their own sources. They'd have, uh, they'd use some wood from, uh, they'd buy some of the wood, but they also have their own sources, and especially the East Indian Company, um, teak and building their woods, uh, they're building their ships in India. It's so one of the things, the big shipyards which are built in India, which become Royal Navy dockyards, etc., are all built for the East India Company to build their ships. Yeah. Setting up that infrastructure is one of the key things the East India Company does in India. Without it, 
their hold would have been over a very, very short time. Uh, good for them. Almost three minutes in. Solution. If you have grandkids, give them the end pieces. If not, grab two random kids off the street and have them eat it. Provided you get the cake, the, ki uh, the cake to kids, fasten the authority to get you, there should be not be any kidnapping charges. <laughs> um, okay. I, I don't have any children, let alone grandchildren. Um, I don't even have a girlfriend at the moment, so that's problematic. But I do have lots of little cousins. And in the nicest way, the fact you think I could cut cake around them and actually the cake would survive fast enough for me to actually la for last three minutes, uh, for them me to select which one gets the piece, is you have a lot more faith in their ability to hold off from chocolate cake than I do. Hmm. <laughs> they run. Dog food bags get everywhere. Rarely used by the dog, oddly. <laughs> yeah. You say that, but... We were coming back from holiday once, my family, and I noticed... Everything was being organised in little green bags, and I went... Those are dog poo bags. Why are we taking a whole load of dog poo bags? And my sister turned around and went... Yeah, um... Well, funny story. All the uh, cling film food bags that we had, um, they've got holes in them and are terrible. So you're taking the food back in dog food bags. Well, they're hygienic. Have you told... We were on a big family holiday. Have you told mum and the aunts this? No? Okay. I noticed this because it was being loaded in my car. I was being used as the... Um... Well, I usually nickname it the paddy wagon because... I tend to have all the luggage loading in my car. Our stones. Any chance of victory still some of those original timbers? Interesting idea. There is a possibility that there are some very early timbers still in it. And they have done some analysis to try and find out. And there are suspicions. But they're also very careful about what they say because I think... I think the view is that if they any of the original timbers, which it might still remain in her, would be considered potentially so valuable to certain collectors that it could cause issues. So they don't discuss that. But if there are, it's not going to be much left. Cox, the moment when you walk in the classroom and Prof is arguing with a cafeteria chef, to be fair, that only happened to me once, and it was because they made the BLT an LBT, which is wrong. Now, let me explain. It's called a bacon, lettuce, and tomato sandwich, so it should go bacon, lettuce, tomato. Okay? It wasn't in the classroom, it was in the cafeteria. And it was served, and it was lettuce, bacon, tomato, which is wrong. It's wrong. For those who think I might be slightly pedantic, it is wrong. William Cox. Um, if only we could build ships out of coal or magnesium. No. I've read that the centre of France was once one great forest. Then the Industrial Revolution happened. Uh, there was also building all their ships. Mm-hmm. Cox, imagine sending agents, pro uh, agents provocateurs to France to start forest fires. <laughs> you, you, you probably meant that in jest, but actually there were several plans at certain points to try and get groups to go and do that, but they decided not to, because... <laughs> ultimately... The Royal Navy decided that wood was too valuable for even for them to burn up. They wanted that wood. They'd have preferred to send people to nick wood uh, ships loaded. Uh, they to nick and um, ships which were loaded with wood, which were taking it to the various shipyards. So one of the things which you don't read about in many of the uh, many of the sort of fiction books or even many in history books, is the fact that the efforts the Royal Navy would go to to try and find lumber convoys. I know, we talk about 
the oh, treasure fleets, etc., coming back. Yeah. The Royal Navy, mm hmm, were happy to go after the treasure fleet. But they were also equally happy to go after a lumber convoy. A load of ships carrying wood to the, ver to the dockyards. If they spotted a ship carrying on which looked like it was loaded with had a load of wood, that ship would be taken. And that was a vessel which would I uh, that would be money which would be very much appreciated by the crew. You think it's a share of booty from treasure would always be the richest prize they could get, but certain points you bring home a vessel loaded with wood a large amount of oak. A surprise. You'll get some money for your crew. You will. And it's one of the reasons why HMAS supply and those sort of vessels, they're built fast to move supplies between the various dockyards. But also, <laughs> there are warships always... Wherever they're going, if there's a group of them taking supplies, if there's more than one vessel doing it, so they, they will be a warship escorting them. <laughs> Because those supplies were valuable. Even though the British were blockading the French, they would worry about privateers getting out and attacking them. Because those supplies are valuable. Wood has worth. <laughs> What's the quote? Cunningham said it takes free, maybe three years to build a ship. It'll take 300 years to build a new tradition. Um, yeah, basically that's the transcription of his version, which was, was goes... Uh, but the, there are diff some sort of disputes over the phraseology... Three years to build a ship, 300 years to build a tradition. But the phraseology comes from terminology which I've found and I've talked about before, which is three years to build a ship, 30 years to train a crew, 300 years to build a tradition. Well, in the, if we consider in the Age of Sail, it took roughly 150 years to build a ship. If you've got 300 to build a tradition, then the building the crew becomes the quickest and cheapest part. That changes things around. When the chip's the quickest thing to try, uh, uh, quickest thing to change, then uh, and you to, to build. That's changes the uh, the things again. Changes the calculations. When the crew is the quickest thing to train and create, it changes the calculations and value of things. Ryan, thank you for watching. I hope you've enjoyed. I hope you found it interesting. And... Take care. And hopefully see you on Sunday when I will have the second camera will be focusing in on the construction of a very certain little light cruiser behind me, which is everyone. And thank you to whoever supply has sent it to me. It's very kind of you. Bye.